Greetings, everybody. Happy Sabbath day. Today is July 8th, 2022. Sorry that I've been neglecting everybody. This is Chaplain Bob Walker, Light of the World Ministries. In John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Sorry I've been neglecting you, everybody, but I had to go back to work. Everybody, you know, knows what it's like, I guess. So um, please pray for M in Illinois. She is having major problems, possibly related to a medical type procedure. And no, it has nothing to do with the uh, recent thing going on. I got to talk in code speak because of you know who tube. But this is going to be, I think, uh, what, which, um, let's see. I think this is part, I'm not sure. Part 13, I think it is. Maybe it's 14. But this is a continuation of Judah's scepter and Joseph's birthright by J.H. Allen. This is part two, uh, chapter three of part two. No, actually, I'm wrong. It's part 14 of Judah's scepter. Boy, this has been a really long series here. Boy, there's a, yeah, there's a lot of, a lot of studies here. All right, well, this is part three, and the title of this chapter is called The Tearing Down and Rooting Out. And this is on page 169. Um, if you've ever read the book of Jeremiah, and I did a, an entire commentary on my playlist on the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah is kind of a depressing book to me. Um, God was very, very angry with his people and gave them a lot more than a swift kick in the rear. Matter of fact, he allowed the Babylonian Empire to come and kill a large portion of Judah and take the rest into slavery into Babylon. Yeah. How would you like to be put into slavery? Matter of fact, uh, you've heard of Daniel, Daniel in the lion's den. Uh, Daniel was made a eunuch. And if you don't know what a eunuch is, let's just say um, they take well, let's just say that they remove a man's ability to have children. Yeah. Yeah. Y you get the idea. Daniel was one of the eunuchs. You know, the king is going to have all these male servants running around with uh, his wives around, and he wants to make sure one of the wives doesn't um, decide to have somebody besides the king so he removes the possibility of that ever happening so yeah um but did daniel complain no daniel had a very good spirit um uh, matter of fact i did a bible study on uh these three men if you look it up you know you go to the uh my channel and if you go to the where it says videos and you go to the right side uh, it has like a little magnifying glass and you type in three men it talks about noah i think it's noah abraham and daniel about when the sword or war goes through the land that the lord would spare those three men 
but wouldn't even spare their families. I mean, and I think the United States is just about there. I mean, there is no abomination too great for the United States. I can't speak about Europe. I know that when I was in Germany in the mid-1970s in the Army, um, I did a lot of walking. Uh, of course, yeah, I was in the Army, you know. I could walk, oh, I don't know, 18 miles. I could do it. Used to do it all the time. And uh, me and an Army buddy, we were walking through a part of town, and I was kind of following him, but uh, I don't know if he did it intentional or we just stumbled across it, but he'd been in Germany longer than I had. But we went through what was called the red light district. And they have the women in a storefront, um, just like if you were window shopping at a, you know, uh, any other store, you know, they got like when women go to a, a dress shop, they got the mannequins dressed in dresses in the storefronts. Well, they had the women dressed in uh, lingerie or I don't know, bikinis. I don't, I don't know. And uh, showing off their um, wares, I guess you could say. And, uh, you could go in and partake of that sort of thing. Um, I didn't, but uh, could have. I did, probably didn't have the money. I don't know. But, uh, I mean, can you imagine that? Red light district. Um, and the United States has the same thing. Um, I think it's Nevada. Matter of fact, the uh, Internal Revenue Service had a what they call a whorehouse that they had seized for taxes i forget what year that was it might have been in the 70s or in the 80s i'm not sure i think it was called the mustang ranch if i remember the story correctly um yeah so nevada has their little prostitutions legal gambling you know, 1966, the United States uh, allowed the formation of the Church of Satan. Gave them tax-exempt status. They have chaplains in the military. And no, Chaplain Bob has no affiliation with that uh, group. So, um, a matter of fact, if you look at the FBI crime statistics for kidnappings from the 60s going through the 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000, 2010 to the 2020s. Um, you will see that the kidnappings have skyrocketed. Are they doing something with the children i suspect they are but uh, can i prove it no i'm absolutely positive they are i mean that's you know they they did that kind of stuff in the old testament they burned their children alive to uh ball b-a-a-l So, are we any different than in the days of Jeremiah? I mean, abortion, drug use has skyrocketed. Um, just take a look at the word sorcery in the New Testament, which is Greek. It comes from the same root word as pharmaceutical, pharmacy. It has reference to spells, magical spells incantations uh potions drugs yeah i mean i do a lot of research and 
sometimes I watch television just to see what their the themes are. You know, you got movies about vampires and magic, witches, you know, Harry Potter. I mean, it's, people think it's just harmless fun, you know, and good witches fighting bad witches. Oh, yeah. The Bible tells you no such thing, but uh, as good, you know, they're not, none of them are good. Bible has a solution, but uh, we don't have a stomach for that anymore. So is there anything that's too evil for the United States or the West in Europe? I don't think so. I really don't think so. Are we any different than in the days of Jeremiah? I don't think so. I had a pastor that I probably taught me most of what I know. One I have a great deal of respect for. And I remember him saying that the leaders of a country will be a spiritual reflection of the state of the people. So if you've got wicked leaders, you've got wicked people in a wicked nation. So, yeah. But uh, yeah, I do have a, a commentary on the book of Jeremiah. And like I say, it's kind of depressing. But uh, God is a just and holy God. And he hates sin just as much today as he did 6,000 years ago. And yeah, I'm one of those people who thinks the Bible's about six, or the uh, creation was about 6,000 years ago. Yeah, I know they'll say, well, you know, the earth is millions and millions of years old. Uh, how do you know that? Is there, is there a, uh, a date on the dinosaur bones? And some people say that there are, are no dinosaur bones, that they're all fakes. I've heard all the museums have fake bones. I don't know how true that is, but it wouldn't surprise me. Virtually everything they tell us is a lie. George Carlin, comedian, once said that he says, I have a, a set of rules that I live by. And the, my first rule that I live by is I don't believe anything that the government tells me. He was right on a lot of things. Unfortunately, I don't know if he was a goat, tear, whatever you want to call him, but uh, organized religion turned him away and uh, did the same thing to me when I was a uh, teen. You know, but all right, well, let's read chapter three, part two, chapter three, the tearing down and rooting out. Pursuant to the object of Jeremiah's call and work, the first king on David's throne to be dis dip disposed of was Josiah. For it was in the 13th year of his reign that the call of God, uh, let's see, yeah, that the call of God came to Jeremiah, as you may know by reading Jeremiah uh, chapter 1, verse 1 and 2. Jeremiah himself gives no account of the downfall of Josiah. But it is recorded in 2 Kings 23 and 2 Chronicles 35th chapter. It took place in the days of Pharaoh, Necho, king of Egypt, and Char Chemesh, king of Assyria. Josiah himself, 
Josiah himself was a good man and a good king. He did all that he could. He did all that he could. Uh, he did all that could be done to restore the people to the worship of God. He had all the wizard wizards, workers with familiar spirits, images, idols, and abominations put out of the land. And by abominations, I'm talking about, uh, give me an L. Give me a, a B. Give me a G. Give me a T. What's that spell? Abomination. What's that spell? Abomination. So he had all of those people put out of the land. And I'll guarantee you, he didn't give them a Greyhound bus ticket. No. He... he put them out of the land. He got rid of them. But the Lord would not stay his threatened punishment of the kingdom of Judah, which had become worse than Israel. Bob's note here. If you read Jeremiah 3 in verse 8, God divorced Israel because of their wickedness. But then you find out that Judah was even worse than Israel. But because God had made a promise to King David about always having a man on the throne, he did not totally, well, he didn't divorce Judah for that reason. So, let's keep reading. Concerning the goodness of Josiah and also his inability to prevent the impending calamity, it is written, Quote, and like unto him was no king before him that turned to the Lord with all his heart and with all his soul and with all his might, according to all the law of Moses, neither after him arose any like him. Notwithstanding, the Lord, the Lord turned not from the fierceness of his great wrath, wherewith his anger was kindled against Judah because of all the provocations that Manasseh, son of Hezekiah, had provoked him withal. And the Lord said, I will remove Judah out of my sight as I have removed Israel, the ten tribes. And that's in 2 Kings 23, 25 through 27. Not only was Josiah the best king they ever had, and not only did he put away those abominations, but he also kept the greatest Passover that was ever held in Israel or Judah since the days of Samuel the prophet. To this, pa uh, to this Passover, that good king gave 33,300 cattle and oxen, and to this the princes and people gave willingly of their flocks and herds until the number was swelled to many thousand more. The sons of Aaron made themselves ready the people made themselves ready. The sacrifices were killed. The blood spilled. The offerings were burned upon the altar of the Lord. And the people kept the feast of unleavened bread for seven days. Um, Bob's note here. Uh, the sacrifice of the lamb was a foreshadow of what Christ did. Remember, John the Baptist said, Behold, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world, pointing, referencing Christ, and uh, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Leaven is always in Scripture likened unto sin. So you were to make bread with no leaven. And what did Christ say at the Last Supper? That the bread was his body? Yeah, take, eat, and, you know, this is my flesh, and, uh, you know, drink the wine. This is my blood of the new covenant, not the renewed covenant that didn't work, you know, the first time, like the Hebrew roots heretics claim, you know, who oh, didn't work the first time, but we're going to give it a second try. Uh, isn't that the definition of insanity? Doing the same thing over when it doesn't work, you know, you you really think you can keep 600 and something laws and never break one? 
What about uh, when you're five years old and you steal a cookie? Oh, thou shalt not steal. Oh, you broke it. So you need a lamb. You know, don't listen to the Hebrew roots people. Don't listen to them. They're devils. So, so the people kept the feast of unleavened bread. They kept the Passover, but all this was availed nothing except a personal blessing to Josiah that he should die in peace and not see the destruction of Jerusalem and the captivity of the people. No, the eternal fiat of God had gone forth. And we think that no number of worshipers, no number of good kings or good men, and surely no mighty army of bad men could stay the downfall of that nation. Uh, fiat means to create something out of nothing. For the Lord says, after all this, when Pharaoh Necho, the king of Egypt, came up to fight against uh, Char Shemesh, king of Assyria, Josiah rashly, without provocation, made it his business and went out to fight against the king of Egypt, who kindly tried to restrain him and sent ambassadors to him, saying, What have I to do with thee, thou king of Judah? I come not against thee this day, but against the house Assyria, wherewith I have war. For God commanded me to make haste, forbear thee from meddling with God who is with me, that he destroy thee not. And the record records, nevertheless, Josiah would not turn his face from him, but disguised himself that he might fight with him, and hearkened not unto the word of Necho from the mouth of God, and came to fight in the valley of Megiddo. Uh, Megiddo, I think, if I remember correctly, Megiddo is where the Battle of Armageddon is going to happen. Uh, okay, that's Bob's note there. And the archers shot at King Josiah, and the king said to his servants, Have me away, for I am sore wounded. His servants therefore took him out of the chariot, and put him in the second chariot that he had, and brought him to Jerusalem, and he died, and was buried in one of the sepulchres of his fathers. And all Judah and Jerusalem mourned for Josiah, and Jeremiah lamented for Josiah. And that's in 2 Chronicles 35, 21 through 25. So, Jeremiah saw the good king pulled down and lamented him, together with the whole nation, and the singing men and women made an ordinance of lamentations for Josiah, and Shalom, the son of Josiah, ascended the throne. But the Lord had said, I swear by myself. Hmm. Yeah. Can you imagine that? I swear to God. But God is swearing to God. I swear by myself that this house of Josiah shall come to desolation. So he says to his lamenting people, Weep not for the dead, neither bemoan him, but weep sore for him that goeth away, for he shall return no more, nor see his native country. For this the Lord, touching Shalom, the son of Josiah, which reigned instead of Josiah's father, which went out, of this place. He shall not return any more, but he shall die in the place whither they have led him captive and shall see this land no more. Jeremiah 22, 10 and 12. Thus, Jeremiah records the fact of another overthrow, and so the work goes on. Jehoiakim, another son of Josiah, was next to take the throne of his father's but hear the judgment which was pronounced upon him. Therefore, thus saith the Lord concerning Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah. They shall not lament for him, saying to each other, Ah, my brother, or my, ah, my sister. They shall not lament for him, saying, Ah, Lord, or ah, his glory. He shall be buried with the burial of an ass, drawn and cast forth beyond the gates of Jerusalem. Jeremiah 22, 18 and 19, for disposed of, who is next? As I live, saith the Lord, through Coniah, the son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, were the signet upon my right hand, yet would I pluck thee hence, and I will give thee 
into the hand of them that seek thy life, and into the hand of them whose faces thou fearest, even into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and into the hands of the Chaldeans. And I will cast thee out, and thy mother that bare thee, into another country, where ye were not born, and there shall ye die. But unto the land where unto they desire to return thither, they shall not return. Is this man, Kaniah, a despised broken idol? Is he a vessel wherein is no pleasure? Wherefore are they cast out, he and his seed, and are cast into a land which they know not? O earth, 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 hear the word of the Lord, thus saith the Lord, write ye this man childless, a man that shall not prosper in his days, for no man of his seed shall prosper, sitting upon the throne of David and ruling any more in Judah. Jeremiah 22, 24 through 30. Thus, Kaniah makes the fourth king who has been disposed of since the Lord called and commissioned Jeremiah. But there is still another, as recorded by that prophet. And King Zedekiah, the son of Josiah, reigned instead of Kaniah, the son of Jehoiakim. Jeremiah 37 and 1. Zedekiah, the successor to Coniah, ascended the throne about 600 years before Christ. His reign lasted only, only 11 years, and he is the last king of the uh, Davidic line who has reigned over the nation of Judah from, this, from that day to this. Yet God said that he would build up David's throne unto all generations, and prior to that he declared, The scepter shall not depart from Judah, his posterity, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come, and unto him, Shiloh, shall the gathering of the people be. That's in Genesis 49, 10. And Shiloh, I'm positive, is Christ. With these facts before it, before us, it behooves us to look well into the history of Zedekiah and learn his fate, and also that of his family. During the reign of Coniah, the predecessor of Zedekiah, the king of Babylon, had come against the kingdom of Judah, subdued it, and carried away the king, his mother, his wives, and others into Babylon. Consequently, at the time when Zedekiah ascended the throne, the country of Judah was a province of Babylon. But then the tolerant Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, took Mataniah, the third son of Josiah, who was of course brother to Jehoiakim, Coniah's father, and changed his name to Zedekiah, then made him king instead of Coniah. We do not purpose, especially at this time, to go into endless genealogies, as it is generally confusing to the reader. In this Josiah family, there were at least two Zedekiahs and Zedekiahs along the family line for centuries back. There were also Shalom's and Shalom's and Shalom's, and even Kaniah's name is spelled three different ways. Bob's note here. Um, a lot of people don't know it, but uh, Webster, you know, Webster's Dictionary. Yeah, that Webster. He standardized um, spelling of the English language. And in the UK, um, you know, during the time of the Bible was written, you could have the same word spelled several different ways. But it's the same word like Shiloh and Shalom uh, means peace. You know, Jesus was called the Prince of Peace because one day he's going to slay all the enemies and there's going to be peace. But uh, we're not there yet. So, um, so, yeah, let's keep reading. And oh, by the way, Webster... Uh, in his 1828 dictionary, uh, he was 
not only a language scholar, but he was also a believer. Yeah. So, we will also say for the benefit of the more critical student that often a man is said to be the son of another man when in fact he is grandson or even further removed. Christ is called the son of David and yet David is his great grandfather 28 generations back. Think about that, people. From David until the carrying away into Babylon are 14 generations and from the carrying away into Babylon unto Christ are 14 generations. Matthew 1 and verse 17. So, this Zedekiah of whom we write is the third son of Josiah, for we read, And the king of Babylon made Mataniah his, Coniah's father's brother, king in his stead, and changed his name to Zedekiah. Zedekiah was 21 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 11 years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Hamatal, the daughter of Jeremiah of Libna, 2 Kings 24, 17 through 19. Thus we find Jeremiah making the following record concerning Coniah's successor. And King Zedekiah, the son of Josiah, reigned instead of Coniah, the son of Jehoiakim, whom Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, made king in the land of Judah. Jeremiah 37, 1. Hence, this young king, the fifth to occupy the throne of David since Jeremiah had received his commission, was his own grandson. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. All right, so let's read. The work of rooting out and tearing down has been well done so far, and we may rest assured that although the prophet's own flesh and blood are on the throne and dwelling in the palace, the God-assigned work will not stop. But if there should be any uh, very young or helpless members of the family survive the, the wreck which must come during the tearing down and rooting out period, who would have, have a greater claim as their natural protector than one so closely allied by the ties of blood as this very man who God has chosen for the work of building and planting as well as of tearing down and rooting out. Jeremiah records the downfall of Zedekiah and his sons. The royal princes as follows. In the ninth year of Zedekiah, king of Judah, in the tenth month came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and all his army against Jerusalem, and they besieged it. And in the eleventh year of Zedekiah, in the fourth month and ninth day of the month, the city was broken up. And all the princes of the king of Babylon came in and sat in the middle gate, even Nergal, Sharizar, Shamgar, Nebo, Shar, Shechem, Rab, Sassuris, whatever, Rab, Mag, with all the residue of the princes of the king of Babylon. And it came to pass that when Zedekiah, the king of Judah, saw them and all the men of war, then they fled and went forth out of the city by night by the way of the king's garden, by the gate betwixt the two walls. And he went out the way of the plain. But the Chaldeans' army pursued after them and overtook Zedekiah in the plains of Jericho. And when they had taken him, they brought him up to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. So Riblah in the land of Hamath, where he gave judgment upon him, then the king of Babylon slew the sons of Zedekiah in Riblah before his eyes. Also the king of Babylon slew all the nobles of Judah. Moreover, he put out Zedekiah's eyes and bound him in chains to carry him to Babylon. And the Chaldeans burned the king's house and the houses of the people with fire and break down the walls of Jerusalem. And that is recorded in Jeremiah 39, 1 through 8. In the 52nd chapter of Jeremiah, there is a statement of these events to which after recording the fact concerning the king kings being carried to Babylon in chains, there is added the following. And the king of Babylon put him in prison till the day of his death. Jeremiah 52 and 11. 
Thus ends the history of the last prince of the house of David, who has ever reigned over the uh, people of Judah from that time until the present. And we know that they are not now as a nation being ruled over by any prince of their royal family, for they are all scattered among all the nations of the earth and are now fulfilling not the prophecies concerning their ultimate most glorious destiny, but a class of prophecies which pertain to this period of time of being scattered, which are those of becoming a hiss and a byword, crying for sorrow of heart, vexation of spirit, and leaving their name for a curse. When those events occurred, which resulted in the overthrow of the Zedekiah branch of the royal house, a climax was reached, not only in the history of all those things which were involved in the Davidic covenant, but in that the predestined work for the accomplishment of which God sanctified and sent Jeremiah into this world. By this climax, the first part of his mission in all its phases was now most thoroughly accomplished, namely the plucking up, throwing down, afflicting. Indeed, it was so well done that the heretofore accepted authorities in theologic, historic, and ethnologic matters have taught that the scepter thrown and kingdoms of David were wiped out of existence together with the house of David, excepting only another branch of the family of Josiah, who were carried away into Babylon captivity, of whom came Christ, the son of David, who, according to the scripture, must yet sit upon the throne of his father, David. We will give but one example of that class of sophistic, uh, sophistical reasoning, which has uh, led the mind of the Christian world into this gross error. Take, for instance, the well-known and much-used Polyglot Bible published by Samuel Baxter and Sons of London. The compilers of this work, whosoever they are, we know not, give what is called a summary view of the principal events of the period from the close of of the sacred canon of the Old Testament until the times of the New Testament. According to the system of chronology, time period, which this works adopts, the overthrow of Zedekiah occurred in the year 589 BC. Bob's note here. When you see um, BC, E, um, and CE. BCE stands for Before Common Era. And CE means the Common Era. ERA. What they're doing is telling you that the birth of Christ, the virgin birth of Christ, is just a common event. You know, uh, happens every day in the maternity ward, you know, another kid's born. Uh, what they're doing is they're deny, denying uh, B.C. stands for before Christ. B.C.E. is Antichrist, basically. And uh, A.D. means Anno Domino, which is Latin for year of our Lord. So B.C.E. is denying that Christ is Lord. So when you see a, the, that as a dating system, know that you're dealing with an antichrist. Yeah, keep that in mind. All right, um, so the overthrow of Zedekiah occurred in the year 589 BC. The proposed summary begins after the return of the people of Judah from the Babylonianish captivity. For while they were yet under the dominion of the kingdom of Persia, and when Antiseroxes long Imanus was the reigning king who was in his 20th year commissioned Nehemiah to rebuild the jaw the Nehemiah to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem an event which happened according to the chronology used in 446 BC 
uh, Nehemiah was the king of Jerusalem when Persia, this is Bob's note, uh, Persia conquered Babylon and allowed Judah to return to Jerusalem and rebuild it. So Nehemiah was the king of Israel and Ezra was the high priest. And you can read the book of Ezra, you can read the book of Nehemiah. And that followed after David, or not David, uh, Daniel. Daniel is a record of what happened in Babylon. And Daniel probably died just around the time of the, uh, after the Persians had conquered Babylon. So I don't believe Daniel returned to Jerusalem. I don't, I, I don't think so. I think he died real shortly after that. I don't know exactly. There's a lot of details in the Bible that just don't exist. So, all right, let's keep reading. We're on page 178. Then follows a brief record of the death and succession of kings, the rise and fall of dynasties and overthrow of kingdoms, powers, dominions, and empires. But it's always shown conclusively that these ruling powers, whatever might be their nationality, were dominating the people of Judah. The summary shows that Alexander the Great marched into Judea to punish the people for certain grievances which, in his mind, they had practiced against him as commander of the Grecian forces, and that God thwarted him in that purpose. It shows that when Alexander died, the Grecian Empire was divided among his four generals, that Palestine was given to Laomedon, one of his generals, and that it was soon taken away from him by Ptolemy, the king of Egypt, that they rejoiced to submit to this new master and what the consequences were. Uh, Bob's note here. Cleopatra. Everybody's heard of Cleopatra and her famous beauty, right? Mark Anthony and, you know, uh, Cleopatra was a daughter of Ptolemy, from what I understand, and she was Greek. She wasn't even an Egyptian. She was Greek, you know, probably blonde hair, blue-eyed bombshell. I don't know. But, uh, you know, our history has been destroyed. And by the way, the New Testament was written in Greek. And I've heard a lot, and if you've ever heard of the uh, what's called the Septuagint, it's a Greek translation of the Old Testament. And wouldn't surprise me if it was inspired. Wouldn't surprise me one bit. Um, and because of Greece conquering, you know, Alexander and his generals conquering that whole area, Greek became the common language of commerce in that in the days of Christ. I mean, it, it was just common. Um, Rome was a relative newcomer. I mean, if you wanted to deal with the government, you could talk to them in either Greek or Latin. But, um, you know, when, when Pilate was talking to Christ, you, you really think that Pilate was talking to Jesus in, in Hebrew? No. And there's nothing in the Bible about Pilate using a, a translator. Nothing. I, I suspect that they were speaking to each other in Greek. That's my opinion. Can I prove it from the Bible? No. Uh, it's very possible that Jesus preached to the multitudes in Greek. Now, in the temple, he might have used Hebrew. I don't know. One day we'll find out, probably. 
But, um, you know, it's why the New Testament was written in Greek. You know, and the Hebrew roots people hate that. They hate they hate the New Testament being written in Greek. They hate the name of Jesus. They hate it. If they didn't hate it, they wouldn't use that you shoe uh name. You know. I think they should take the you shoe uh name and give it the boot. Well, I I, I would, you know, so so, um, all right, Palestine was given to one of the generals that it was soon taken away from him by Ptolemy, the king of Egypt, and that they rejoiced to submit to this new master and what the consequences were. It shows that they suffered under Antiochus Epiphanes, um, especially after a false rumor that had spread concerning his death, which they believed and rejoiced in. And that in consequence of this rejoicing, he slew 40,000 persons, sold as many, uh, as many more for slaves, plundering the temple of gold and furniture to the amount of 80 talents of gold. A talent was approximately 70 pounds. So that's about uh, 70 pounds is about 32 kilograms times 80 that's a lot of gold, people. Um, 80 talents of gold entered the Holy of Holies and sacrificed a sow upon the altar of burnt offerings and caused the broth of it to be sprinkled all over the temple. No greater indignation than this could have been put upon the people. The summary continues a truthful record of suffering after suffering, trouble after trouble, and... Um, indignity after indignity heaped upon the conquered people who during all these centuries reigned over by their enemies the gentile nations but not once does the record show no not for even one generation that they were ruled by a prince of their own royal house finally the summary ends as follows at length antipater a noble but crafty idumean by favor of Julius Caesar, was made procurer, procurator of Judea and H.Y.R. Harkanus continued in the priesthood. After Antipater's death, his son, Herod the Great, yeah, Herod the Greatly, the evil one, greatly evil, by the assistance of Anthony, the Roman uh triumvir some roman noble or something and through much barbary and bloodshed assume the regal dignity which authority was at length confirmed by augustus caesar he maintained this dignity with great ability but with the utmost cruelty in his own family as well as among others till the birth of christ now remember herod the great murdered all the young children in Bethlehem. In the interval, he built many cities and to in I-N-G-R-A-T-I-A-T-E um, in Gradiate, I know, himself with the Jews, almost rebuilt the temple. Bob's note here. Herod built the temple not to, for the worship of God, but for control. I'm positive that, you know, he's the one that put put up the high priests, you know, the, the, the ones that condemned Jesus to death. Yeah, and they weren't Catholic priests either. His cruel attempt to murder the infant Savior is recorded by the evangelist, and soon afterward he died most miserably. After some years, during the dominions of Herod, were governed by his sons, Judah became a Roman, Roman province, and the scepter, scepter departed from Judah, for Shiloh was come, the Italics are their own, and after having been under the government of Roman procurators for some years, the whole state of Judah was at length subverted by Titus, 
the son of Vespian. Uh, memory serves me correctly, Titus was a Roman general who destroyed Jerusalem in 70 AD. And I think Vespian, yeah, Vespian was his father uh, who was the emperor of Rome. So when people tell you that Titus was the Antichrist, uh, they call him Preteris, and that all, all of uh, Scripture was fulfilled in 70 AD, and they'll tell you that Titus proclaimed himself to be God, sitting in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. And that's a quote um, in Thessalonians. I forget exactly where. But you got to realize something. Do you think a Roman emperor's son could proclaim himself God and tell his father that he had to worship him? A mere general telling the emperor of Rome to worship him as God. I mean, that's the stupidity of those that are preterists. You know, there, there was a lot of partial fulfillments done in Matthew 24. A lot of them. A lot of partial fulfillments. But uh, preterists who say that all the prophecy was fulfilled in 70 AD, they want you to believe that this present wicked world is Christ's kingdom come. And uh, to make preterism work, you have to ignore the entire book of Revelation. Yeah, where's the new Jerusalem? You know, where is it? Did it come down from heaven? You know, uh, Revelation 20, 19, 20, 21, 22. Um, did you see Christ return in glory? It said every eye will see him. Um, I must have missed that. You know, you too, right? Yeah. And then they'll say, well, Christ returned at Pentecost. Uh, yeah, but did he return in glory with all his angels, the mighty army, the cloud of witnesses? No. You know, these people are devils. Read your Bible. Don't follow me. You know, I'm just some clown that's read the Bible a couple times. You know? But don't ever follow me unless I'm leading you to Jesus. That's what can I tell you? These people lie and they lie and they lie. And one day God's going to. God hates those that lie about him against him. Oh, they're they're going to get a, a hotter spot in hell. Jesus said something about uh, the Pilate that those that delivered him uh, those that deliver Jesus unto Pilate will receive the greater damnation. So not only is there damnation, but there's a greater damnation. So I guess there's a hotter compartment in hell or something. I don't know. So. Um, do, 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 do. Let's see. All right, the whole nation of judah was at length subverted by titus the son of espion the sophistry in the use of those italicized words as employed by the compilers of that summary is that they destroy the evident meaning of the prophecy to which they refer by the substitution of various scepters held by various kings of various gentile nations that have consequently uh, consecutively held dominion over the Jewish people for one particular scepter which the Lord promised should be held only by some member of Judah's family line and which should not cease to be held by those of his posterity until Shiloh should come. If the view was put forth in the closing sentence of that summary is the true one, then the entire prophecy must, for several reasons, go by default. 1. A scepter did not depart from over Judah when Christ came. Forty years after Christ had come and gone, finds them still under the power of Rome. Shortly afterward, they were dispersed and have since been scattered among all nations where they remain unto this day and are still being ruled over. 2. In the first coming of Christ was his Shiloh coming, then Shiloh failed, for the people did not gather unto him. Did uh, Bob's note here? Did Israel return to the land? 
um, no, the Antichrist returned uh, to the land. Yeah. You know, when Israel went to the promised land under, um, well, Moses was replaced by um, Joshua. Joshua, not Yeshua. Joshua, the sixth book in the Bible. The Canaanites were already in the land. Well, the Canaanites returned to the land, not Israel. You know, in the year 19 and... Uh, 40 and um, 8, yeah, yeah, the Canaanites returned to the land, not Israel. Christ didn't come in glory in the clouds with his people. No, I didn't see that. Neither did you. Um, verse 3, the Lord declares, Judah is my lawgiver. According to the summary and other acceptable evidence, Judah as lawgiver departed from the uh, Judeans, 588 years before Shiloh came, hence that unabridged chasm of nearly 600 years stands like a gaping wound in the side of the church of Jesus Christ whenever she is compelled to show herself in naked honesty. The entire trend of this summary with its subtle reference to the prophecy in question seems to be that so long as the nation of Judah was ruled over, no matter by whom, and held together as a province or a state, this prophecy was vindicated, whereas each vindication, conception, or use of those words is only an attempt to hold together by daub, daubing with untempered mortar an edifice which is tottering and tumbling. The most charitable construction which can be put upon such accommodating, mollifying, weak, and uh, uh, abortive attempts to vindicate the truth of God is that the persons are ignorant of just some such vital point as the fact that Jeremiah was called and commissioned of God to build and plant anew the plucked up kingdom of David. All who claim that Christ has come as Shiloh are compelled to resort to just such distortions of the divine word as the one under consideration in order to fill up that gaping hiatus of 580 years from the overthrow of Zedekiah until Christ. Furthermore, after they have plastered over that gap to their own questionable satisfaction, they are still confronted with the fact that the Lord God did not give unto Christ the throne of his father David, nor cause him to reign over the house of Jacob, no, not even spiritually, for the Judeans are a part of the house of Jacob, as these men themselves are compel compelled to admit. Also, the Judeans are enemies to the gospel of grace, which Christ, which Jesus Christ came to bring. But as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sake. And Bob's note here. And not everybody that claims to be of Judah is. Take a look at the second chapter of the book of Revelation, and then take a look at verse 9. There are those that say they are and are not, but are the sin of Gog of Satan. Yeah, got to talk in code because of you know who to. Yeah. Meanwhile, the great question which confronts us is this. Has God suffered his faithfulness to fail or allowed any of his promises to go by default or permitted his covenant either by uh, with Judah, David, or Christ to suffer or lapse? Uh, the very thought that such could possibly be the case causes us to feel the very... Uh, feel the first chilling blight of skepticism to fall heavily upon our hitherto believing and happy hearts. The next link in this chain of this divine history is of much deep import um, than it, that it is impossible for us to overestimate its value. As it is connecting link between sacred history and prophecy, for you will notice in the first clause of the following text, we find a record of events which have become history but before 
the sentence is finished, we are carried out into the field of prophecy. It shall come to pass that like as I have watched over them to pluck up and to break down and to throw down and to destroy and to afflict, to, uh, so will I watch over them to build and to plant, saith the Lord. Jeremiah 31 and verse 28. The Lord here uses the already accomplished facts of history as a basis upon which to rest his promise concerning the accomplishment of those which are yet future. Hence, upon events which once were prophetic, but which have now become history, he predicts the fulfillment of others which are still in the future, but these events must follow as a sequence. But these events must follow as a sequence to those which have gone before, since both these which are past and those which are yet to come were originally couched in the same prophecy, in the same commission, and were to be accomplished by the same prophet, Jeremiah of Libna. The Lord had said that David should never lack a man of his own seed to sit upon the throne. Query, where was the seed which with Jeremiah must build and plant. That is the end of this chapter. Uh, the next chapter is going to be chapter 4, Vindication of the Personal Prophecies, Promises to Jeremiah. And if you want to do some research on this, um, look up Tia, Tifi, Tifa, Tefi, T-E-A, Second word, T-E-P-H-I. Supposedly, according to legend and history, uh, she was a daughter of the king of Judah, went with Jeremiah to Ireland. Um, and you could read about... Uh, did you ever hear about the Irish famine? I forget what year it was, but... Um, Ireland was starving to death. I think they had a potato blight. I'm not sure. But um, a lot of Irish came to America because they were starving in their own country. And um, supposedly, I've heard, England was exporting food when the Irish were starving. Well, guess what? Oliver Cromwell overthrew um, the King of England, King James's son, killed him, and allowed the you know who's back into uh, England. They had been expelled from England. They were kicked out, booted out, and uh, he allowed them to come back in, and then they formed the Bank of. England and uh, now they have paper money just like we do we have paper money with pictures of presidents they got paper money with a picture of the Queen yeah so uh, yeah no more silver coins no more gold coins you know you ever heard of a pound sterling yeah, a pound sterling was a pound of sterling silver, which was, what, 99.99% pure silver? A pound, 12 troy ounces? Yeah, people, that would be worth uh, do, 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 probably around three, 250 to 300 U.S. dollars today. Instead, it's you got a piece of paper with the picture of the queen on it. A lot of good that'll do you. I think I'd rather have the pound of sterling silver, but hey, that's just me. So, I hope you uh, are enjoying this study. And again, I apologize, but I had to go to work full time. And, you know, I'm Social Security age. You know, I'm not a kid anymore. I'm tired. A couple nights ago, I went to bed 
Oh, well, I, I I get up at around um, two hours before I got to go to work. Takes me forty five minutes to an hour to drive to work in the morning. Traffic, horrible traffic, and takes about the same amount of time to go back home. And um, a couple hours after, like a couple hours after I got home, I went to bed. Seven o'clock. I was tired. I'm old, tired, old and tired. So, you know, I'd like to do more Bible studies, but you know what? Look at my playlists. I, I don't even know how many Bible studies I got on playlists, but a lot. I got the book of Isaiah, book of Jeremiah, book of Ezekiel, um, all kinds of ed edu education for the end times. Um, people, the Antichrist comes first. The Bible clearly teaches the Antichrist comes before, the man of sin comes before Jesus does. But your pre-trib rapture people say, oh no, Jesus is coming first. I'm looking for Jesus Christ. I'm not looking for the Antichrist. Well, then your Christ that you're looking for is going to be the man of sin, the son of perdition, the, the Antichrist, the beast. That's going to be their Messiah because that's who they're looking for. If, he's not, if, he, if he doesn't come in the clouds and you're not caught up together with him in the air, it's the wrong Messiah. And with hologram, holographic technology, they could actually fake a Messiah coming in the clouds. Yeah. And they've got a way to do sound, too. And I'm not talking about giant loudspeakers. I'm talking about, um, they have a thing, I forget it's called, um, it transmits something to the bones. Um, if you took a microphone, the microphone couldn't hear the sound, but your the bones in your ears and your head, you can hear the sound. So they could ha have the blowing of the trumpets or whatever and have the Messiah coming in the sky. But if you had a microphone on, you wouldn't hear. You wouldn't hear it. Um, I forget what they call it, bone something or other. Uh, but the U.S. Navy was using that to transmit um, commands long distance, like when a fishing, an Arab, Arabic fishing boat got too close to a U.S. naval ship, they would speak to them in the Arabic language and saying, uh, "You're too close to the Navy ship. You're, you know, move away, or you know, <laughs> trouble will follow." And um, the Arabs were like freaking out, you know, where's this voice coming from? Because it's a beam. And you could have two people standing five feet away from each other. And the one person's hearing it, but the other person's not. And it's loud to the person hearing it. So if you're not in that beam, you don't hear the sound. And some people thought that they were um, hearing voices. Matter of fact, I heard during the Gulf War, they used this technology to say that Allah was telling them to surrender rather than fight. I don't know how true that is. I, I read that somewhere, but it wouldn't surprise me. You know, the, the, the U.S. news media and all the West, all the West is controlled and George Carlin said, I have certain rules I live by, and the first rule is not to believe anything the government tells me. Good advice, really. Um, coming from probably an unsaved person. You know, I, boy, I tell you what, he told a lot of truth, considering, so, yeah. All right, well, all blessings, praise, glory, and honor to God the Father and His only begotten Son, Jesus, who is the Christ, the Lamb of God, slain from the foundation of the world. 
In Jesus' name, amen.